Hello and a very warm welcome to Europe Now. Well, this week we're taking a look back at some of the more defining moments of the year so far. It's been 12 months since the UK voted to leave the EU. Brexit negotiations have only just begun getting underway with a British Prime Minister who has a minority government having called for snap elections and lost a number of seats. We travelled to the UK just ahead of those parliamentary polls to meet with British MEPs there to get their views one year after the referendum. For Conservative MEP Charles Tannock, EU citizens' rights is a top priority. Oh, Charles, See you, Minister oh, Jane. How are you? Oh, Love to be in your patch. Thank you very much for coming to help. Yeah. Peter, my local councillor. About 15% of the people in this ward are actually EU nationals. Quite a lot of interest in the doorstep in obviously an early settlement of the, the, the rights. Yeah, well, I'm very pleased my wife became British uh, this week. She ah. swore the oath, but she's an EU citizen, she's yeah. dual national. Well, my husband too. He's a Greek citizen uh, and he naturalised last year. Uh, you know, a huge number uh, of the doctors and nurses come from the European Union, 15% of all academics. <laughs> Well, we've now come to a market in central London, in Chelsea, and this market really is a mix of, you know, the finest British produce, but also uh, the French uh, right alongside it. Do you fear, Mr Tannock, that Brexit could impact on that and maybe decrease the amount of cultural diversity in the city? I doubt it very much. London uh, is, is, is more robust than that. London has a very ancient tradition of absorbing different cultures. So, no, I think that we will obviously carry on eating and enjoying French cuisine, Euro European food, particularly, I mean, spaghetti is a national dish. But, of course, the prices will go up because there may well be tariffs. Yeah, even this idea in the, your party, the Tory manifesto, that, you know, if we hire uh, EU citizens to work, it could be... a £2,000 of a tax on that? The way that's been introduced at the moment is for non-EU. It's not for the EU. E Non-EU citizens will have this surcharge to employers of 2000 But, of course, once Brexit happens, uh, everybody will be non-EU, so there will be a surcharge, presumably applied to Europeans in the same way, unless, again, something is negotiated. If Europeans stop coming, we still need a lot of uh, labour in this country, unskilled labour in particular. We, the United Kingdom will have to recruit in, in, the, in, in the Commonwealth and other countries, and I'm not quite sure that's what they voted for, people, to, to change the pattern of immigration. Is Brexit definitely going to happen, or is there still a chance to change? Oh, I think it's definitely going to happen. I think the uh, resolve of the government's absolutely clear. You know, I think it would be tragic if we have the hardest Brexit. Uh, I am very lucky. I now have an Irish uh, passport, so I'm all right personally, again, it's, but not many Brits have that option. While well, questions over the rights of EU citizens in the UK and British citizens in the rest of the EU are as unclear today as ever. As the EU marked the 60th anniversary of the Treaty of Rome, the founding text of the EU, one of the descendants of the men who signed that text told us he was worried he could lose his EU citizenship, something he said would have horrified his grandfather. On March 25, 1957, the signatures of these men sealed the destiny of Europe as we know it today. They were Europe's founding fathers, and for their own grandchildren, the European dream still looms large. My grandfather, Maurice Faure, is sat next to Adenauer. He was the youngest signatory of the Treaty of Rome. He was 35 years old. I think he was carried by the post-war energy, which pushed them to reach a deal through negotiations. For my grandfather, Benvenuti, the Treaty of Rome was, it has to be said, a compromise, in that for him, the real goal was to build a political union. For us, our grandfather was there during this historic phase. It's taken on a mythical status. When I was a child, I wasn't told much about my grandfather. I knew that he had been an important figure and that he'd been the president of Italy. It was only when I was studying European law that I discovered that he had signed the Treaty of Rome. That was a great surprise for me. My grandfather was Prime Minister of Belgium as well as Foreign Minister. Throughout his life, he believed passionately in Europe. He taught us about the love of a vision for Europe, the idea of peace between a whole host of different peoples, nations that have been fighting amongst themselves for centuries. 
and now there was peace. Three generations on, Europe has been at the heart of all of their lives. Ludovico Benvenuti spends his working days at the European Parliament. Uh, I know this place well. I spend a lot of time here. This descendant of the Italian signatory is now a lobbyist. Working in Brussels means he's close to where the major decisions are made. I'm an official lobbyist. The advantage of Europe is that it is totally transparent. In my case, when I meet with an MP or a European civil servant, it's immediately made public on the Commission's website. In Rome, Laura Segni has also seen her career dominated by European affairs. I worked in the Italian Ministry of the Economy. I took part in many European talks, and I've negotiated lots of European rulings for Italy. But one descendant faces a very European problem. The grandson of the Belgian signatory, whose father was British, could lose his European passport because of Brexit. It's entirely possible that I lose my European citizenship. That would make me very upset. Honestly, I'm glad my father never saw Brexit. It would have killed him, and my grandfather would have been appalled. Sixty years on, for all the Treaty of Rome has achieved, the Europe of 2017 has failed in many ways to live up to their grandfather's hopes. We need to move forwards. We need to move in Europe towards a greater political union. That's not a utopian ideal, it's simply pragmatism. We can't miss this opportunity to make Europe more democratic. We have to be realistic. Today it's impossible. No one wants a common European defence force. No one wants shared debt. No one wants a shared legal system. The political conditions for that are not present today. The European Union faces challenges from within and without. For these committed pro-Europeans, the clearest threat comes from the rise of populist politicians. I'm terrified of Trump and of Marine Le Pen here in Europe. The UK's Nigel Farage is just a joke, he scares me less. I'm losing my status. My grandfather would be very sad. We are spoiling it. We haven't destroyed it yet. I refuse to let that happen. I don't think the flame has been extinguished. But we have to be very careful not to let it go out. Sixty years on from its birth, the future of the EU is far from certain. For the next generation, the ideals of the Founding Fathers may need to be updated to better suit the 21st century. Well, you heard there from the grandchildren of the Founding Fathers of the EU, hope that the EU will turn a corner and get stronger, some calling for more EU integration. However, one issue the EU remains deeply divided on is the migration question. Italy has seen tens of thousands of people arrive again this year hoping for asylum, adding to the half a million already there. In a number of towns, migrants have started to work for free, carrying out community services. They say it keeps them occupied and fit. However, many are convinced it will also help them get their asylum requests approved. NGOs fear it's a form of exploitation. The results of a morning's work, a heap of rubbish bags filled with leaves and waste. The streets of Fiumicino are getting a spring clean. For local resident Angela, come to offer refreshments, it makes a change to see people taking care of her town. It's been 30 years since local people cleaned it up here. In summer, there would even be small snakes on the pavement. For me, it's great to see these young men working. The street cleaners, though, are not municipal employees. Coming from Ivory Coast, Mali or Gambia, they're all migrants waiting for asylum requests. When a migrant centre was opened in the town last summer, it initially drew opposition. But opinions have changed thanks to the newcomers working four days a week, free of charge. I have a place to sleep, I have food. That's why I'm happy to work for free, because Italy's providing me with everything. It's good. It's good for the body all the time. 
I I working and I still I do exercise. An increasing number of Italian towns encourage migrants to perform community service. In Fiumicino, out of 60 or so migrants lodged at the centre, a dozen have volunteered. For the authorities, it's win-win. The cheap labour, a way to incite other towns to take in more migrants. How are you? Ciao. The state pays 35 euros a day for every migrant housed in Fiumicino. For the mayor, the free labour is more than welcome. These workers are really crucial for us because our budget is stretched already. Municipalities find it hard to make progress. We built this cycle path, but we really struggle to keep it in good condition. 500,000 migrants have arrived in Italy over the past two years. Over a third of them have lodged asylum requests. Officially, voluntary work and asylum claims are not related. But at welcome centres, many migrants are told that it could improve their chances. They told us this work can help us get our papers. It's win-win. That's why we're taking part. I hope they keep their promises. But those promises are exaggerated. Over half of asylum seekers will see the request refused. In Rome, the Boabab Association comes to the aid of those who've dropped out of the system and are living on the streets. For this humanitarian organization, the voluntary work system is just another form of exploitation the migrants face. I want the migrants really to have a choice to work or not, and if they choose to work, then they should be protected by improved Italian labour law. Working for free is not the Europe that many migrants dreamed of, meaning many of the people who arrived in Italy want to continue on to other European countries, still in hope of a better life. Well, the latest strategy of the EU is to focus on measures aimed at keeping migrants outside of the bloc, sending money and promising projects across Africa to dissuade people there from making the journey. And that follows the EU-Turkey deal aimed at keeping Syrian refugees from travelling. This year also saw a reinforced EU border security agency sent to Bulgaria, the EU country that shares a 270-kilometre border with Turkey. Luke Brown went to see how it's working and also checked in on conditions of refugees currently in Bulgaria. A routine identity check 10 kilometers from the Turkish border. The local police are suspicious as they don't recognize this vehicle. This area, shrouded in fog and snow, is on the migrants' route to the EU. The two Bulgarian frontier police are working alongside two German officers, part of the EU's new permanent Frontex force. Their equipment, like this thermal imaging camera, proving invaluable. There's a difference between the heating of a fresh footprint because the person was walking in and the regular snow. And so you can see if the footprint is uh, probably in the last hours. The objective for the Frontex operation is to reinforce the EU's external border. The almost 100 strong force based here, providing vehicles and expertise, while the Bulgarians bring the local knowledge. It's not the same like working in, in your own uh, country, but uh, since, uh, since we are all good trained and well trained in the European Union as police officers, uh, the cooperation works pretty well. The flow of migrants has slowed to a trickle in recent weeks. The harsh winter conditions, while providing cover, meaning illegal crossings from Turkey are just too risky. The Lesovo frontier post is a strategic point. It's just one of three crossing places along the Turkish border. The Bulgarian frontier border guards check every truck, looking inside, underneath, checking the seals and using CO2 sensors to detect human breath. 203 illegal entrants were caught here last year, a figure in sharp decline since 2015. The results speak for themselves. Thanks to the efforts by Bulgaria and the support of Frontex, there's been a real drop in the number of cases. Bulgaria's 270-kilometre-long land border with Turkey has been heavily reinforced since 2015. This is the front line in Europe's attempts to stem the flow of refugees into the EU. All my men here at Lesovo feel a special responsibility. Here at the entry to the EU, they realize the importance of the job they're doing. If caught, many of the migrants end up here at the Ofja Kupel Center in Sofia. 
Having crossed by foot into the mountains of Iraq and Turkey, Jawad Zalfo and his family arrived from Syria. But the conditions in the camp are proving unsatisfactory. The situation here isn't good. There are ten of us in this room, and the people in the camp are very dirty. They throw their rubbish everywhere. In all, there are over 800 people in this centre. There are six camps in the country. The authorities complain they're badly overstretched. Taha Sabah, Ismail and his family are from Mosul in Iraq. They fled in October, just as the government offensive against the Islamists in their hometown began. We tried to show the children as much love as possible, to make up for everything that they've been through. Taha hopes to reach Western Europe to find work. He and his family were already caught once before as they tried to leave Bulgaria. If we do get asylum and if I find work here, we'll stay, of course, but we can't put up with these conditions for too long. All I want is a job. I'll leave for Germany if that's what it takes. For now, the winter means few people are willing to leave the warmth of the centre. Once the spring comes, the flow of migrants into Bulgaria and the hopes of continuing westwards will resume. OK, time for news now, but we'll be back again after the break. See you then.